Welcome to Sovereignty in Action. I'm your host, Ian Record. I am honored to be joined today by Dr. Sarah Kostelik, who is an enrolled citizen of the native village of Uzinki in Alaska. She has worked for the National Indian Child Welfare Association since 2011, becoming its executive director in January 2015. Prior to joining NICWA, she served as founding director of the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians. In November 2014, the National Leadership Network Independent Sector awarded her its American Express NGEN Leadership Award, calling her a transformational leader working to further policy research that empowers American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Welcome, Sarah, and good to have you with us today. Thank you. So uh, before we dive into our main topic of discussion, can you provide us with a brief overview of, of your nation? Just who is the native village of Uzinki? Uh, Uzinki is a small Aleutic village near Kodiak, Alaska. According to the 2010 census, we had a population of 161 people. Um, we're located on Spruce Island, which is just a brief skiff ride from Kodiak. Um, traditionally, we uh, subsisted on marine life, including whales, so whaling. Um, was a big uh, practice in our community. Um, we have a community archaeology program and we can trace our uh, community back for over 9,000 years in our region. Um, and we have a really wonderful Aleutic museum and repository that has some amazing exhibits about um, our subsistence and tools and implements and our language. So um, really a, a really wonderful community there. So. Before we get into the particulars of the uh, Indian Child Welfare Act, its history, its current status, yeah. tell us why this issue, why did you choose to make this issue the heart of your professional calling? In Indian Child Welfare is about um, children's connection to family and community. Um, at its heart, it's about children's right to have relationships with their fam family and culture and community and it's about the rights of tribal governments to protect their children. So in my mind, there's nothing more fundamental to our community and to our cultural values than protecting our children. So what compelled, uh, what compelled tribes and tribal leaders across the country to originally push Congress to pass the Indian Child Welfare Act in the first place? Um, how and why did it become law? This really is a prime example of tribal community organizing across the country. Um, so there was a study that was published in 1977 by the Association on American Indian Affairs that showed that 25 to 35 percent of Indian children, so a quarter to a third of Indian children, were being removed from their homes and 85 percent of those children were being placed in non-Indian homes or institutions. So when you think about that wholesale removal of our children, uh, tribal leaders were outraged. And so communities organized across the country, um, the Association on American Indian Affairs was involved, data was collected, this was presented to members of Congress. Um, so it really was um, an amazing example in the early 70s of tribes advocating for children. Um, so after that study was published, um, Congress passed the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978. Uh, in the preamble of the act, it says that there is no uh, issue more fundamental to the continued existence and integrity of tribal governments than their children. So really, um, our children are our most important resource for the future of our cultures and community. Um, so the Indian Child Welfare Act does a couple of things. It provides minimum standards for state removal of Indian children for their homes uh, to prevent that unnecessary removal that we talked about. And it also provides a framework for tribes to exercise their sovereignty to protect their children and to run child welfare programs. So it's been nearly 40 years since ICWA um, became the law of the land. Right. And from your perspective, where does it stand in terms of its enforcement, its implementation? Um, is the true spirit of the law being adhered to in practice? I think we would have to say no. I mean, if you look at the data, uh, we know that Native children are still being removed from their homes at two to three times the rate of, of white children. We know that Native families are uh, least frequently offered support services to keep their kids in the home and most often have their kids removed as a first option. Um, there's a body of literature that talks about 
um, bias in the child welfare system. And we know that Native families, when they present a case that has the same facts as a white family, that they are twice as likely to be investigated and that their investigations are twice as likely to be substantiated in the same exact circumstances. So there's clearly bias in the system. Um, I would say from a personal note, um, NICWA receives over a thousand phone calls and emails every year from grandmas, from aunties, from relatives who are trying to figure out how to navigate the child welfare system, from social workers and judges who are trying to figure out how to follow the act. And I can tell you that every day we're witness to violations of ICWA. People are telling us the stories on the phone. People are telling us they don't know about the law. They don't know how to follow it. People are saying that they'd never even asked if a child was Indian, uh, so they never even knew if ICWA applied. So I think both um, in terms of the data, the research available, as well as in terms of our personal experience, it's pretty clear that we have a long ways to go in terms of compliance with the law. And I'm, I'm glad you bring up this issue of compliance because that was my next question. Yeah. Um, you've been quoted as saying that currently there exists rampant non-compliance yeah. with the act. Can you explain what you meant by that and, and the damage that non-compliance is causing? Good, yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, from the data I just cited, it's pretty clear that things aren't going the way they should be going. Um, unfortunately, we still don't have good data about, that's precisely about ICWA compliance. So the best we can do is look at the disproportionality of Indian children in the system. So um, the proportion of Indian children in, in the population in relationship to their um, representation in the state child welfare system. So for example, in Alaska, where I'm from, our native child population is 19% of the overall state population. But when you look at the proportion of native kids in care, 62% of the children in the state child welfare system are native children, are our kids. So clearly there's something wrong. That's unconscionable. Uh, but we don't have data that it points exactly to ICWA compliance. And fortunately, that's something that the Children's Bureau at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is working on. So we're trying to get to the point of collecting that data precisely. Um, in absence of that, we know um, from experience, as we're talking to states who are trying to implement laws, as we're talking to tribal communities who are fighting for their kids in the state system, uh, as we're seeing the wave of litigation across the country, we know that ICWA is not being followed. So um, it's really incumbent upon us to do something about this. We can do better. ICWA gives us the framework. We should be doing more about this. And isn't uh a potentially huge step in ensuring compliance and holding particularly state governments, judges in the state court system to account to actually live up to the spirit of the law. Isn't that embodied in this new set of regulations that's currently in the works? Um, yeah. And how do those new regulations um, seek to rectify this situation and, and how will they ensure that compliance? Good. So the first thing I would say is that the regulations are a huge step. Um, ICWA was passed into law in 1978. In 1979, the Bureau of Indian Affairs promulgated state court guidelines, so not even regulations, but suggestions, guidelines, in 79, and those weren't updated until 2015. Um, so what we see is that there's been um, a severe lack of attention to the enforcement of this federal law, for whatever reason. So the fact that the regulations were promulgated is just huge. Um, in March of this year, those draft regulations um, allowed for the first time ever um, the opportunity for tribes to, to litigate when the law isn't being followed. So when state courts block transfer to tribal courts, um, when state agencies don't even bother to notify a tribe that they have an Indian child in custody, tribes have recourse now. They have an opportunity to do something about that. Um, so these regulations, when they're finalized, will hold the force of law. Uh, so that's huge. I think in terms of some of the particulars of what the regulations as proposed do, um, you know, they clarify that the Indian Child Welfare Act is applicable not just in um, involuntary proceedings, so when a state is removing a child because of the allegation of abuse or neglect, but they also pertain in voluntary cases. So previously, um, that was a very gray area of law but these regulations make clear that ICWA applies in, in voluntary cases too. So that's significant. The regulations also clarify um, a state court created exception 
to the application of ICWA. So for, for years now, a number of state courts have held that as long as an Indian child isn't being removed from, quote, an existing Indian family, that ICWA doesn't apply. So this was basically a loophole that state judges created to allow for a subjective assessment about whether a family was Indian enough, whether they spoke their language, whether they went to powwows, how many times a year they went back to their home community, but to allow state court judges to decide who's Indian enough and whether ICWA should apply in that case. So the regulations make clear that the existing Indian family doctrine uh, is not legal. State courts don't have the ability to do that. So there are really um, a significant number of um, important provisions there that clarify how ICWA should be implemented and that give very clear direction to state courts and hold them accountable for what they should be doing. So in, in closing, how, how is NICWA along working in tandem with, with NCAI to see these regulations through, mm -hmm. to see them implemented, and just how do they work together on this issue in general? I would actually take a step back and say when our organization was founded uh, in 1983, we were talking with NCAI about the establishment of this new organization. And when we, when we went from becoming um, a regional organization, a Northwest Indian Child Welfare Association, to a national organization, once again we were in communication with NCAI even about uh, how our work could complement one another and what kind of relationship we would have with one another. So we have a long-standing memorandum of agreement with NCAI, decades old. Our board president serves as the chair of NCAI's Indian Child and Family Welfare Subcommittee. We have a formal relationship with your youth commission who appoints two new youth board members to our board of directors uh, every three years. So we have a really solid partnership. Um, in this area, I think, you know, one of the strengths is that we recognize that we have complementary roles and expertise. So we really are the child welfare technical experts, but NCAI has the relationship with tribal leaders and the convening power that allows us to get the right information in front of tribal leaders at a critical mo moment in time when we really need their advocacy. So I think this relationship is about communicating uh, public education, uh, materials for tribal leaders, um, in some cases, unfortunately, litigation strategies and media and communication strategies. But the working relationship is really close and solid. Well, that's about all the time we have. So really appreciate you taking some time to share your thoughts and experience and, and wisdom with us. And, and good luck on this, on this worthy cause. Thank you so much, Ian. That's all the time we have on today's episode of Sovereignty in Action, a program of the National Congress of American Indians. To learn more about Sovereignty in Action, please visit NCAI's website at www ncai.org. Thank you for joining us. Copyright 2015, National Congress of American Indians.